And um, excellent, there's a recording button. We got it. We're gonna talk about how much school choice already exists in Iowa and why it's important to recognize that when you're talking to legislators. Um, Melissa's gonna describe what was in the governor's proposal to begin with. And um, we're gonna talk a little bit about the impact of school choice initiatives in other states and then be happy to take any of your questions. So I'm gonna share my screen, which really keeps me efficient at talking about what I'm supposed to talk about. And um, I'm gonna go down to where I have this part here on, uh, I, I just wanted to start with this first. So um, much of the conversation about school choice starts with an assumption that some people believe students need to escape from, and I'm gonna say our failing public schools, because that's the language that we've heard in some of the debate that happened in the Senate in particular last year. And just to let you know, when you're talking to anybody about our Iowa public schools, we can be proud of them for a lot of reasons. Um, we started a statewide voluntary preschool program as one of the first states to implement that um, back in 2008 and about 31,000 of our students four-year-olds before we got into the pandemic were in that. And that means our students are more likely to read on grade level, less likely to be in special education, uh, more likely to be successful, taxpaying working citizens who are contributing to our economy and our democracy. Um, we have just a slightly smaller number of students identified as special education compared to the national average. And we think that's partially because of that good preschool program. Um, Iowa is number one in the nation in college credits earned while in high school per capita. And that's another thing to be proud of, all the tuition dollars we save our parents and the exposure to college level work that we give to our students. Through 2019, we have the highest graduation rate in the nation, almost 92%. I think there's been a little bit of uh, distortion with that due to the pandemic with other states just graduating all students. So I don't know what it looks like in 2020 and 2021, but we're gonna be very near the top, if not the top. And this last one I like too, 82% of Iowa high school students take higher level math, algebra two or higher. And that includes 86% of girls and 78% of boys. Now, um, I want to talk just for a moment about test scores, because I'm going to get into this at the end of the conversation when we see what's happening in other states. The NAEP is the National Assessment of Educational Progress. It is a test that is administered to a random number of students who are representative of every state's population in grades 4, 8, and 11, and it's every year. And in those, in the NAEP scores clear back in the 90s, Iowa ranked in the top of nearly every metric. And so I put the 1990 scale scores on there because when we were number one in math, fourth grade math, that's when we were, had a scale score of 221 and we were 11 points above the national average. In 2019, our fourth graders actually scored 20 points higher than that. So when people say, our schools are failing, they're not doing as well as they were in the 90s, we're actually doing better. Other states caught up to some extent. After the pandemic, the 2020 score, um, Iowa at 240, we lost one scale score point, but many states lost more than that for fourth grade math. So we're now about five points above the national average. And you can see the same kind of patterns for reading in fourth grade and eighth grade math and reading as well. So at that time, um, think of Iowa in the 90s in the top 10, and people will say all the time, what has changed? And our demographics, of course, have changed. We've got double the rates of students who are living in low-income families as we had um, back in the early 2000s. We've got many more. I think about 6% of our students are students who are not English speaking to begin with. Um, we've got different challenges with our students, and still we're doing pretty well in comparison to what we did in the 90s with those test scores. But I think the biggest thing that has changed, at least since the 80s, in the 70s and 80s, Iowa spent more per pupil than the national average on our educational system. And what that money does, 80% of our general fund buys staff, it buys our quality teachers and paraeducators and administrators and all of the curriculum and support staff and, and things that we need for our students to be successful. And then and from 1990, Iowa was uh, $453 below the national average, and that's where the decline started. By, 19, by 2019, that shortfall had grown to $1,254. 
And the most recent data for 1920 shows us now $1,536 below the national average in per pupil spending. And that's happened primarily because in the last decade, we've had increases in the per pupil allocation that were less than inflation and less than what other states were doing. And so that kind of sets the stage for this conversation of private school expansion in Iowa. So I'm gonna talk primarily about what kinds of choice we already have. First of all, this is just a history since 2006 of non-public school enrollment. These are the students that enroll in accredited non-public schools in the state. And it was declining slightly, hit that low point of 30,729 in 2021. That bump up to 36,000 and, and some more uh, happened after the COVID pandemic began and students and families were looking for full-time school. And that created an impetus when many of our public schools, especially in urban areas, had to go to hybrid or even uh, virtual schooling for students in order to maintain uh, safe and healthy practices during the pandemic. We don't know if that will sustain. We'll keep you posted on that. So the school tuition organization tax credit is one vehicle for providing scholarships for students to attend private schools. And this is from a source from the Iowa Department of Revenue talking about this tax credit in January of 2019. So you can see kind of the history back in 2006 when it started, just about $2 million and how the total number of awards issued are up to over 3,500 scholarships. And also that uh, the total awards issued 12 million, the total number of scholarships peaked at over 3,500, dropped to 3,000. This is a way that individuals or corporations can donate money at a heightened tax credit, credit amount. So if they give $1,000 to say the Catholic diocese, which is that school tuition organization, they get to write off $650 of tax liability. So it only costs them that 35%, and that amount was raised more recently. So this was back in 2019. That money then goes to those organizations to be given to accredited private schools to provide scholarships for families below 400% of the federal poverty level. And just for context, 400% of the poverty level is more than double the eligibility for our students to get free and reduced price lunch in our public schools. It's about $111,000 of income annually for a family of four. So we certainly wouldn't call that a family living in poverty. So when you say 400%, it's really four times the poverty level. This next chart also comes from the Department of Revenue and it talks about the distribution of tuition grants and financial aid by family income. And what I think is really meaningful about this chart is the map in the bottom right-hand corner. It shows where those school tuition organization tax credits were awarded by school district. This data is 2017, so it's a little old. So you can see the, the dollar amounts awarded and you can almost identify our urban centers where our bigger private schools are located and they would be in the red. The other thing you see is that little graphic, that little black dot for the non-public schools. And there are entire portions of our geography that have no non-public school within a legislative district. And I think this became one of the reasons why many of our rural legislators, including our rural Republicans in the House, were reticent about the policy that Melissa is going to explain to you. This is the history of the school tuition organization tax credit cap. It started just at that 3 million in 2006. Most recently, it has been increased now to $20 million annually. And that's the amount that comes right out of our general fund revenues that would otherwise be available for, uh, for our state's uh, priorities and uh, has expanded, you can see over several years where that's been going up. The other tax credit that provides support to non-public school families is the tuition and textbook tax credit. And this allows an individual household to claim 25% uh, of the first thousand dollars that they spend for each dependent. And I'll show you in a minute where that's been increased as well. So this is back in 2017, I think, when that is uh, talked about, 2019 is the report. Um, most of our public school parents 
also pay fees if they're not eligible for free and reduced price lunch. They pay textbook fees. Those could be uh, you know, upwards to $100 maybe. So 25% of that would be a $25 tax credit compared to the larger tax credit that private school parents would receive because they pay a greater amount in tuition. Now in 2021, part of the education um, uh, omnibus bill that had lots of policies in it, it doubled that tax credit to 25% of the first 2000, which of course is most likely beneficial to families who pay higher tuition to private schools. And then it also added homeschool expenses to that eligibility. The other recent policy shifts we've seen expanding school choice uh, two years ago, a new charter school law, which can be a charter school, not just chartered by a public school board that's elected to represent the community, but by the State Board of Education, despite the local school board opposition. Um, the open enrollment was expanded without any open enrollment deadline. So now students can determine next Friday, they're gonna change from one school to another if their parents fill out the request form and the school to which they want to go has capacity to uh, serve them. And for uh, five districts that have concentrated minority and concentrated poverty two years ago, they eliminated a voluntary diversity plan that allowed those districts to regulate open enrollment out of their district. And our, our fear in that, and we'll see the policy unfold going forward, but that was Des Moines, Waterloo, Davenport, Postville, and West Liberty, concentrated minority, concentrated poverty. Um, we'll, we expect to see open enrollment out will increase the concentration of those two metrics. And it's, it's not impossible to educate students of low income, it just takes additional resources to make sure they have all of the supports necessary to be successful. So I think what I'm going to do is stop sharing the screen and say one other thing here, um, before the expansion of charter schools and the elimination of the open enrollment uh, deadline, we were ranked by the Heritage Foundation, which is a very conservative think tank that supports school choice. We were ranked ninth in the country in school choice available to our parents. And I think that's because of our um, pretty liberal uh, open enrollment policy, where you can go basically to any neighboring school district or open enroll to virtual public schools. And there are now about 26 or 27 of those programs available around the state. By the way, if a student is going to one of those, they're still allowed to participate on the football team or in the band of their local school district. So it's kind of the best of both worlds in that situation where they can still be connected to that social outlet and those other activities uh, with other students. We have two kinds of homeschool available to our parents. One of them gets support from the public school district and curriculum and, and um, materials and testing and those kinds of things. And the other is completely independent. And so when we take those two kinds of tax credits, the liberal open enrollment policy, the uh, virtual schools, the two kinds of homeschool, not surprising that we'd, we'd be in the top 10 states in the nation in school choice availability to our parents. The other thing to remember about this is when other studies around the nation say that school choice uh, improved public schools, it's based on the theory that competition makes everybody better and we already have it. And maybe that's why our graduation rate is number one in the country. Uh, maybe that's why we have those impetus to expand program so that high school students can have college level work or internships or other things that, that align with their passions. Um, we're already doing a, a pretty darn good job. So I'll stop with that and turn it over to Melissa. Hey, Margaret, before we move on, just a couple yeah. of clarifying questions. Somebody yeah. had asked if the NAEP um, had been revised in ways that would change the scoring back to when you were talking about the NAEP. Um, um, so yeah, the, the biggest difference is not in the testing questions or how it's administered, but it's now that it's mandated. And uh, back in the early 90s, schools could opt out if they were chosen to participate. Um, now, if you're chosen to participate, you have no choice and you have to. Um, I think the other difference in that um, is just to know that Iowans are really, we're really compliant and obedient when we're told to test our special education students, we make sure that happens. Um, when we see the percent of students that are tested in the participation data, Iowa is really high in that and some other states don't fare so well. Thank you, sorry to interrupt. Mm -hmm. No, not at all. Okay, Melissa. 
Wonderful. Well, uh, thank you again, uh, Teresa and Amy, for the invitation uh, to join Margaret tonight in presentation. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't highlight I am also a product of public schools. I see, I see a couple of my, my friends from the Iowa City area. I am a product of Robert Lucas Elementary, Southeast Junior High, and Iowa City City High. So, Nancy Porter, that was for you. Um, <laughs> I uh, am going to share my screen now and um, uh, share with you kind of some of the things that happened um, last legislative session and uh, a perspective outlook for what we think we can anticipate um, from, uh, anticipate, uh, frankly, starting on January 9th, which is when the legislative session is supposed to begin uh, here for 2023. So we're gonna we're gonna kick it off with a little levity because if we don't have levity after the outcome of Tuesday night's election, um, I, I don't. We're already sunk, folks. Uh, and I know that you are a group of passionate people, um, and we are hopeful that many of you will continue to help us in our advocacy to push back against some of these harmful proposals. So many of you are probably familiar with the Duffy cartoons used to be run on the Des Moines Register. This was one of my favorites uh, that came out uh, shortly after the beginning of the last legislative session. And if you happen to be joining us and you aren't looking at your screen, it just is a picture of the Golden Dome in Des Moines that says, I just proposed the craziest bill of this legislative session. And then there's another word bubble that says, oh yeah, hold my beer. And that's kind of what it felt like for those of us that lobby on behalf of public education. And quite frankly, um, probably felt like that, like uh, for a lot of the colleagues of Amy and Margaret and I <laughs> that also lobby on behalf of their clients last session. But I'm afraid we're going to see a lot more of that, particularly with the outcomes uh, of the election on Tuesday night. For those of you who are not aware, we are now going to have a Republican supermajority in the Iowa Senate. Uh, so with uh, 34 Republican senators and uh, 16 Democratic senators. And then while there are still a couple of things that are up in the air on the House side of things, I believe we are likely looking at 36 Democrats and 64 Republicans. Uh, but again, we've got a couple of outstanding recounts or we'll likely have a couple of triggered recounts here in the near future. I'm gonna skip over um, some funding things. Just know that we have been inadequately funded for quite some time. I believe that this was quite intentional. I think as we have seen in other states, as I'm sure Margaret will highlight in her discussion of what we've seen in other states, when people want to push forward, quote unquote, school choice, proposals, um, and we call them voucher proposals because that's what they are. When they push forward voucher proposals, often before they do that, they try to starve out public education. Quite frankly, they try to create reasons why they are suggesting that public schools are inefficient or insufficient in providing quality education opportunities. Part of that can be done through inadequately funding such an important public education system. And just a couple of things I wanna remind folks as we walk through what happened last session and what we think is going to happen next session. Remember that our public education system, not only does all of the wonderful things that Margaret talked about, um, right, including achieving incredible standards across the country, um, we still have a very proud public education system in the state of Iowa, but we also are responsible for educating more than 92% of the student population. We're talking nearly a half million students. And the teachers, the education professionals that I have the pleasure and the honor of representing don't get to pick and choose who they serve. They serve who shows up at the front door of their school buildings every single day. That includes kids that are very well fed, that are well slept, that are fully clothed, um, and that have amazing community and family supports. That also includes children who come from the opposite end of that spectrum, right? Who need all of the things because they don't have supportive folks in their life. Uh, and so we provide a quality education experience for every single student that shows up on our doorstep and do the best job we possibly can to not only be their teacher, but their nurse and their counselor and their all the other things um, that education professionals have increasingly had to take the responsibilities on doing in large part because we don't have the resources being provided at the state level to make sure that there are even more quality adults, frankly, interacting with these students on a regular basis. So when we see large proposals like Senate File 2369, which was the governor's education omnibus bill of last year, um, 
it can be quite challenging because the suggestion is, is that one, there's something inadequate happening in our public education system. And that instead of addressing what those inadequacies might be and fully funding those programs, instead, some individuals wanna take a similar set of resources and instead of using them to benefit the largest amount of students, carve out specialized populations and use those resources to incentivize non-public education. And so what we saw in the governor's education omnibus bill last year was a voucher proposal tucked into a bill with other elements that would directly impact public education. The division I'm gonna talk about primarily um, related to vouchers is division two of what the governor called her students for a scholarship program. Now, if you remember from last legislative session, we learned about her priorities when she released um, a, a nice proposal at the beginning of the year in her condition of the state speech, the second day of legislative session, which will happen again this uh, upcoming legislative session, where she talked about all of the things she wanted to do to give parents and students choice. That's what this came down to, her students for a scholarship program. Um, the irony was that this voucher proposal, which would have provided 5,000 regular program students and 5,000 students, um, I believe, who were on IEPs, each an opportunity up to 5,000, so a total of 10,000 students to participate in this program. Um, it also said that there would not be additional accountability or transparency, frankly, for those resources being used in a non-public school setting. Uh, and that they shouldn't be encumbered in any way, shape, or form in that non-public school setting. I mention that because you'll see the first division of the bill had to do directly with additional transparency requirements for public schools. So on one hand, we're saying we want more accountability and transparency from our already well-regulated, I would argue, public school systems, which are responsible not only to the Department of Education, but also to their locally elected school boards, but we wanna also take what was the equivalent of over $55 million to subsidize the education in a non-public school setting of these 10,000 students. They also had to be below the 400% uh, uh, percentile ranking of a federal poverty guideline, by the way, which for a family of four would have been $111,000. And I will also point out they were students who were not previously enrolled in a non-public school. But on one hand, we want more transparency for public schools that are already doing all these great things. And on the other hand, we're not gonna have any accountability or transparency for the voucher program to incentivize non-public school uh, education environments. And that was really, really challenging to us for lots of different reasons. Please do not misunderstand. The Iowa State Education Association is not anti-non-public school, right? That's not what this is about, but it is about making sure that our taxpayer dollars go to fund public services of which public education is a large portion of that. And we think that those resources need to be used in a very responsible and transparent fashion. Um, you'll also see in the governor's education omnibus bill, she did some modifications or attempted to do some modifications to social studies instruction, um, wanted to modify private instruction requirements, including um, not having to have the approval of an AEA when it came to a special education consult. There was an open enrollment component, other elements related to teacher librarians. Ultimately, this legislation did not pass because the House decided to take apart the governor's education omnibus bill and frankly move forward elements they thought were helpful and elements that they did not appreciate, they didn't move forward, right? So that would include in particular the voucher proposal. Um, and we were very thankful for that. And despite the political landscape that I have described to you, uh, which includes us moving forward in this challenging conversation without some of our Republican allies, who I will tell you the governor proactively got rid of during the June primary, we still think we have a large contingent, a large enough contingent between the Democrats in the House and some of the incoming Republicans to be able to stop this legislation. But that's where we're going to need your help. Margaret has already gone through some of the non-public uh, funding that has already taken place, so I'm not going to spend too much time on here. Just know that we're already doing an awful lot to subsidize successful non-public education because we understand 
it's important for us to make sure that special education students who are served in a non-public setting, for example, still have quality access to those services that we proudly provide through our area education agencies, for example. Transportation is another important component. These are things that we have provided. We don't think we need to additionally supplement it by creating a secondary voucher program. This is Margaret's territory about what they might try next, but here are just some examples of things that have happened in other states. Um, as Margaret already highlighted, we have lots and lots of school choice. We are very proud of all of the wonderful opportunities we already have in our public school systems. That includes our really expansive, most successful concurrent enrollment program, innovative public school programs, including Montessori and magnet schools. Remember, we also had additional expansion of charter schools in the 2021 legislative session. That includes both public charter schools, which we've almost always had here in the state of Iowa, including those that are regulated by local school boards or affiliated with a local district, and now a new creation that would allow for-profit entity, um, uh, frankly, to manage a charter school. That was something that we were very I would say cautious is probably the most diplomatic way to approach it, um, but is something that, again, provides another opportunity for people who might be pursuing other ideas of innovation. And then we also need to address the apprenticeship opportunities that we've really been partnering with the federal government um, to try to enhance some of those options as well. So whether you're looking at, you know, Apex and Waukee, or you're looking at some of the programs, the Big Ten and Cedar Rapids, we have lots of different options and ways that even our folks in rural districts can connect with some higher education elements, whether it be community colleges or private, you know, public partnerships as well. So we are really doing everything we can in our public school system to make sure that we are meeting our students where they're at and providing them access to as many options as possible. Some of the other things that I think we're gonna see this upcoming uh, legislative session, I'll go back to the voucher proposal. We will see the voucher proposal again. We have actually seen different versions of voucher bills, I would say for the last six or seven legislative sessions. They've all, um, had more success in the Senate than they have in the House. Remember, you have half as many folks in the Senate to get through, so sometimes things can move a little faster um, and there are fewer people to try to convince. We will see about your proposal again. Now I will say we have heard rumors um, and I'm always hesitant to repeat the rumors because I don't want us to become the purveyors of our own like self-fulfilling prophecy, right? But we are hearing rumors that there is going to be a connection between the most recent voucher proposal or the governor's new voucher proposal and supplemental state aid, the SSA rate that was two and a half percent uh, this last legislative session, in which on average has been obviously not keeping up with the, the rate of inflation, which is now you know quite high, but on average has been less than 3% here over the last decade and has been absolutely inadequate. So we could possibly see a voucher proposal tied to a arguably higher SSA number um, in an attempt to try to acquiesce um, or appease some of the legislators who were holding out and not supporting her voucher proposal this last legislative session. I will say um, during the horse trading that happens during the legislative session that we don't always see paper on, right, but that you hear conversations about as people were trying to persuade their colleagues to support the voucher proposal, there were conversations about giving some resources to rural schools um, who otherwise would not benefit from a voucher proposal because they don't have a private school in their area, right? Um, okay, well then that's upset some of the urban legislators. Uh, and that still did not you know, necessarily uh, set aside all of the fears or address all of the fears of rural legislators who understand because they've seen what's happened in other states um, when it comes to overall funding for education in general. And so whatever she comes up with, um, it is really important that we make sure we say, no, we are already doing enough, frankly, to subsidize non-public education. And if they want to do something, to further subsidize non-public education, we must have accountability for those taxpayer resources. We must make sure that they are held to the state standards. It is not acceptable to compare a school that takes care of the needs of every single student who shows up on their doorstep next to an institution that literally gets to pick and choose which students go there. That's something I think we really need to highlight in this conversation. This is not about school choice. 
This is not about parent choice, student choice. Ultimately, the private school is the entity that gets to choose. Because unlike public schools, they do not have the same responsibility to educate every student that enters their building. If a student goes to a private school on a voucher and becomes a discipline issue, has a behavior issue, has a special education need that cannot be met by that facility at any time, and by the way, it doesn't even have to be something like that. If the student violates a code of conduct, if the student happens to be an LGBTQ student who that private school does not follow frankly, our regular civil rights code, they can be told they cannot attend that school any longer, right? And I think that's that's one of the big differences folks need to realize. These are not schools for everyone. Unlike our public schools, where we teach and meet every student where they're at to the best of our ability, right? So I really, when you hear that word choice, we need to think about who gets the choice in that conversation. Some of the additional proposals, I fear we are going to see this legislative session, um, will include, some of you might be familiar with the House File 802, the Divisive Concepts Bill that was passed in 2021. There are many, and not many, there are vocal minority who think that we need to add teeth to that legislation because they think that not good things are still being taught in our public schools. I have news for them. We weren't teaching divisive concepts before. We aren't teaching divisive concepts now. And um, the reason why they haven't found any problems is because there aren't any problems. And I will tell you, we have a couple of legislators who have been actively trying to investigate, I'm using air quotes for those of you who aren't watching the video, uh, investigate and they have not found issue. I will tell you, we'll see additional curriculum and material challenges. Uh, if you all, I'm sure many of you are aware, Jake Chapman and his sinister teacher, comments and his wanting to redefine what obscene materials were and what should and should not be shared you know, with students and his penalties for teachers, guess what? That was one victory Democrats had on Tuesday night. It was getting rid of someone who literally threatened educators uh, and thought all curriculum and material up be challenged. Um, and I think we send a resounding message. When you attack educators, you don't fare very well. And that's something we hope will continue and hope to be able to find moderate friends who realize we don't need to focus on these distractions. We need to focus on the real issues we have. And as Margaret mentioned, take some of those schools that are experiencing challenges by whatever the standard is and raise all schools up so we don't have failing schools, right? That's where we ought to be focusing our energies. Um, Accreditation standards uh, changes. We've been hearing the Department of Education uh, wants to make potentially some modifications to chapter 12 uh, relating to our accreditation. I fear that could be rolled into a higher than usual SSA amount and a voucher proposal under the guise of giving school districts greater flexibility with modifications to chapter 12. I think we're also going to see additional anti-LGBTQ legislation, perhaps a return or a revisit of uh, bathroom bills, for example. I think we're gonna see additional uh, attempts to address the quote unquote staff shortage issue by continuing to push reduction in quality pathways for teacher licensure. We saw that last year with some different proposals that would have greatly reduced the standards for someone to become an education professional in the state of Iowa. Um, I think we'll see it again. And then I do think that we'll see proposals related to school safety. I mentioned all of those things because each one of these topics can and likely will be used by folks to try to explain why we need to provide an option for parents to get their kids out of our public schools under the guise of you can go to a private school so you can avoid somebody stereotyping your child. You can go to a private school so you don't have to worry about your child using a bathroom, uh, a non-gendered bathroom. You can send your kid to a private school because then you won't have to worry about a school safety issue. That's why all of these things are gonna be important. And the other reason why I mentioned these issues is all of these bills again, are a distraction from the great work that our education professionals are doing in the public education system. And I gotta tell you, we heard a lot during this last legislative session and also during the last election cycle um, about, boy, I really wish educators would just get back to the basics. Do you know who really wishes educators could get back to the basics? Educators. Except that's not the world we live in right now. And so whatever we can do as a community 
as neighbors, as friends, as retired education professionals to support the educators that are doing the wonderful work on the front lines right now uh, to help raise their morale, to share with them that you don't think they're indoctrinating, right? That you don't think that they're using the latest acronym, whether it's CRT or SEL or anything else that somebody's gonna try to turn into a incendiary talking point uh, would be really, really helpful. One other slide that I'll share with you is a breakdown of the transparency component. This was the first division in the governor's education omnibus bill. This became a separate piece of legislation in the house. Um, I highlight this in particular because it really, and I know we have a lot of retired uh, and current educators for that matter on this Zoom tonight uh, because y'all are very active uh, and civic minded. This really highlighted, the original version of this bill really highlighted the lack of understanding of the dynamic nature of education. The original governor's proposal, first division of the bill, would have had us posting six months worth of lesson plans um, at a time uh, on a format that could be accessed by a parent or guardian at any time. And it also would have included financial penalties for districts that were not in compliance. So remember that inadequate funding that both Margaret and I have now talked about, you would have been jeopardizing that inadequate funding if you were out of compliance with this transparency legislation. Other elements included um, making sure uh, there was a flow chart, different district information, all kinds of requirements, some of which, by the way, are actually already being done. If you're interested in finding out what materials are in most school libraries, you can access that information if you'd like, or if you are a parent or guardian of your student. Um, I'm sure if we actually had raised hands, many of you would say, I actually get too many emails from my kids teacher, right? Whether it be through the Canvas system or some of these other mechanisms. Um, but the entire argument was this assumption that parents weren't getting access to information when we know that's not true. Um, but then to suggest that we need to micromanage educators uh, and then provide different pathways for people to challenge those resources is, high, is very clearly a, a lack of trust of the education professionals. It's not respecting the experts and the professionals in these conversations. Um, and it's also not being respectful to local school boards that again are elected, unlike by the way, the structures in our non-public schools. So ISDA did work in a bipartisan fashion to make modifications to this proposal that we actually thought could be implemented. And that would have included, by the way, making this not apply to our special educators or special education uh, professionals, because that is also um, a, a very challenging environment that again is incredibly dynamic in nature. It started out in a place where you would have not been in compliance if you had mentioned um, the Ukrainian war, if that wasn't previously reflected in your lesson plans. Or does anybody remember this last legislative session, one of my idols, Madeleine Albright passed away. If you had mentioned that or you had used an internet website or something to go over the history of Madeleine Albright and the impact she had um, on our world and world politics and not immediately updated your lesson plan, you could have found yourself in non-compliance. Or if your substitute who was covering your classroom because you were out of school because of COVID didn't make those updates and an administrator didn't make those updates, you could have been out of compliance. This is the kind of micromanagement and distraction that is happening um, to try to fuel these hyper-partisan national narratives, the public schools are not doing what they're supposed to. This is what we need to get away from. We need to go back to respecting the professionals for the work that they do and making sure that they have all the resources they need to provide a quality education to every student that shows up in our school district. I will stop talking now. I'm sorry, that was pretty long. Amy, you know, Margaret and I both can go on. We're very passionate about this subject. I'll stop sharing my screen. Okay, I think I'm gonna pick it up now and talk a little bit about the key messages that we can use when talking to not just legislators, but neighbors and the public. And, and I think that the polling data still shows that uh, the majority of Iowans don't think this is a good idea. Um, the source of this is, um, and who knows, the supposition of why we're talking about this policy so fervently if it's about um, politics or uh, further aspirations or uh, you know paying back those that got certain people into office, I don't know. But one question I'm asking every legislator and candidate that I visit now is, how many parents in your district did you hear from asking for this proposal because they couldn't afford to send their child to private school? And 
in the last dozen or so conversations I've had, the answer is the same, zero. So it's not because somebody can't get into private school. Um, and indeed the subcommittee conversations that we all were at in the Senate last year, it was people who already go to private school who wouldn't be eligible for these education savings accounts and homeschool parents who wanted to expand, who were there saying we need to do this and, and expand it as quickly as possible. So I'm gonna pick it up here with um, some of the key messages. So, and, and Melissa already articulated these. So I, it's just gonna echo some of those that we really have an unlevel playing field because public schools have more stringent rules and the privates don't have to accept all students. The accountability that private schools are not transparent or accountable. There's no elected school board. There's no stewardship for tax dollars, not even required to have an audit. And they don't publish their budgets or have open meetings or public records where the public accountable for the expenditures of public tax dollars ought to be able to access what they're doing. Um, these kinds of policies shift money away from public schools. So in a year in which there was a 2.5% increase in the cost per pupil, the fiscal note or the, the notes on bills and amendments that accompanied this bill assumed a $79 million reduction in public school funding. And that only counts the state savings the impact to the public schools for every student no longer in the enrollment is greater than that. It includes a loss of over $1,000 that would go into the Secure and Advanced Vision for Education Fund or the, the school infrastructure state penny also goes with that. It, it lowers the amount that could be counted for dropout prevention funding or instructional support and all of the categorical funds that are also tied to enrollment. Those things would further reduce public schools beyond this original estimate. There is no consistent study, especially controlled study that's peer reviewed that shows that students do better either in the public schools left behind or in the private schools to which they go based on an education savings account. And there's lots of other evidence around circulating that's not a very good quality to show that that would happen. And of course, remember, we already have lots of school choice in Iowa. So what problem are we trying to solve? So I'm gonna talk just a little bit to wind this up here with examples in other states. Um, we are, by the way, hoping that the recent expansion of open enrollment may, may make this voucher call for action less attractive for some house members. But in many of the, uh, the rhetorical comments about the, the bill that happened during the election, most of which from the governor, I mean, I didn't hear a lot of school, a, a lot of um, legislators leading on this issue, but the, uh, she's talked about both Florida and Mississippi as good models. So I wanted to take a look at those. So remember, I talked about those NAEP scores at the beginning, that every state uh, participates in that. So it is true that Florida was in the bottom half of states in NAEP scores before they had their education savings account plan, and now they're near the top. So we want to explain why is that possible? Is it the existence of the voucher plan that improved outcomes for public school children? And clearly it isn't. So here are the other things that happened. They had a statewide initiative called Every Child Reads, which provided resources and training for public school teachers all over the state to improve reading instruction. And they created their new universal preschool for four-year-olds at the same time. Uh, Florida also invested in increasing teacher pay along the way to be competitive with that. They also had a retention of non-proficient students in their prior grade, primarily third graders. So why is that important? When you dig into that data, NAEP is applied to fourth graders. So if third graders who aren't proficient in reading are kept in third grade, then the fourth grade test scores ought to automatically go up because you're testing a different pool of students. Likewise, the students with special education, uh, individual education plans were allowed to take their voucher to a private school and private schools popped up marketing to these two groups of students. If your third grader was stressed with testing, come to our private school, we'll take care of them, make sure they have everything they need, but they won't have to go through all those awful assessments. Or marketing to students, who's, to parents with students who have special education needs saying, we have a school designed just for your student, we'll be happy to take that education savings account and serve them. Those are different from, I would say, the good quality mission-driven religious private schools we have in Iowa. Those are more tend to be for-profit, uh, smaller private schools marketing to particular populations. But they removed over 60,000 special education students from the testing pool in NAEP, and then the non-proficient students as well. 
So before the new NAEP scores came out, I looked at the most recent scores the, pre, the prior year and looked at Iowa eighth grade students and compared those Iowa eighth grade students who are not receiving special ed services, so they're called our Iowa regular education students, to Florida regular education students, eighth grade, and our Iowa kiddos had a, a scale point higher than similar Florida students. Now, Florida is near the top and NAEP, we're in the middle. How can you explain that? It's because we're testing different pools of students. And it's not because our students, uh, kind of comparison apples to apples basis, are doing worse. The other thing about Florida is they had a more accountable system for their private school expansion. Um, none of these are requirements were in the bill that Melissa described that was proposed last year in Iowa. They have to ensure all staff submit to background checks. They have to return any funds for which services are not provided. They have to minister the state assessments and tests for all the students who are attending. And they have to annually submit to an independent audit if a private school receives 250,000 in scholarship support from the, uh, the education savings account. And there's lots of information on the accountability mechanisms on the Florida Department of Education website there. Not only are those things not in this legislation proposed in Iowa, but it is actually the opposite. It states in the law that the non-public school does not have to modify any of its academic standards for mission or education program. It states that the privates are not accountable to the state. They don't have to do testing. They don't have to have any uh, data on student achievement. And I really wonder then what the quality of the choice that the parent can make when they don't know how students like their student fare in the educational outcomes in the private school they might be choosing. This last statement um, really drives me crazy because I wish our public schools had this. It says the private schools are to be given the maximum freedom possible to provide for the educational needs of the school students. You know, why can't, why can't we have that too? Um, they actually prevent the private schools from having any additional accountability associated with the stewardship of those taxpayer dollars. The other program that comes up is Mississippi. And Mississippi started with a fairly modest program, only 5 million compared to the 79 million in our, in, in our bill. Um, the vouchers in Mississippi were only for students with special education services. And of that 5 million, uh, over a third of it had to be returned because the parents said no private school would take their child. In both the Florida and Mississippi programs, often parents had to sign away the right to access to special education services for their child if their child was going to be in a private school. And there's a report that was done in Mississippi that uh, motivated the legislature to change some of the things they were doing there because it wasn't working. Typically, and this is the picture of the camel that Melissa had in her slide, uh, these programs start small, but they expand. Um, the way I put this, the camel's nose under the tent is soon followed by the humps. So in Milwaukee Public Schools, they started just in Milwaukee in what they called a failing urban school, but have since expanded statewide. In Florida, they just eliminated all of the income eligibility. So now it's completely open to anybody. In Arizona also started with very uh, low income and special education students gradually increase those income limits. Um, and Melissa already talked to you about the, the eligibility in our bill. But with those kindergartners, that's about 3,100 students annually who attend kindergarten in our private schools that would likely be eligible. So we could get to the full 10,000 slots in three years if we didn't have a single public school parent deciding that their, their kid had to escape that environment to go to a private school. States that initiate and expand private school voucher education savings accounts typically do not appropriate funding for public schools that keeps pace with the nation. And this is what really concerns us. When those private schools pop up and market to students eligible for ESAs and vouchers, they're not necessarily the high quality schools and education systems that our parents expect in Iowa. And our Iowa public school leaders are particularly concerned about inadequate funding given the experience of the last decade and the historic tax cuts that were passed in 2022. I'm just gonna show you two charts and then we'll open it up for questions. So this chart is a history of the per pupil increase, the percent increase per pupil since the formula was created back in 1973. And in the first half of this chart up through 95, there was an automatic pilot indicator, a formula based on inflation and growth and property valuation in the state, some other economic factors that just said, the economy has changed by this much. This is how we should fund schools. Isn't that marvelous that we look at actual economic indicators to decide how schools should be funded? But then in 94, it came off of that, what they called automatic pilot and the legislature started deciding 
uh, ahead of time for the first half of this period of time, what the school funding would be. It was the year prior to the year when they were settling the budget. That practice stopped in the middle of this time period uh, by notwithstanding the law then was completely repealed when we got to 2018-19. So the most recent experience out of the last 13 years there in only 12 of them have the, has the increase per pupil been higher than our cost of doing the business of school. That's that orange band you see. Three to 4% increase is what it takes to age our salary schedules, pay employee benefits, keep up with the costs of fuel and buses and all the other inflationary costs of providing curriculum and materials and heat in the buildings, et cetera. And this year in particular, uh, you know, eight or 9% inflation, um, we're well short of what that takes. And this is a picture out of the, um, the fiscal note that explained the tax cuts and I circled fiscal 27. So we're looking just three years down the road in our budget making timeframe. That's a loss of $1.8 billion in revenue out of a $9 billion budget. So you're talking about 20% loss in revenue. Now we're pretty flush right now. We've got lots in the state coffers, lots in the uh, taxpayer trust fund, but it won't take long for that two and a half billion to be completely gone. And at the same time that we are underfunding our public schools, how can our state afford to take on the additional burden of funding our private schools and eventually our homeschool parents? It's a perfect storm in terms of budget and, and policy. So I'll stop at that and happy to dialogue about this and take any questions that you might have. But I, I think one of the biggest things that we can ask our new legislators in particular is how many of your constituents have come to you saying, I can't get into a private school because I can't afford it asking for this legislation. What problem are we trying to solve? Thank you, Margaret and Melissa. That is a lot and it is wonderful yeah. information. I really appreciate you guys doing this for us. Um, before I um, read a couple questions and then you guys can raise your hands too, um, I did want to um, commend two legislators who are joining us, um, one um, a representative elect and another a senator, Senator Kornbach, who many of you know, um, who is um, one of our educational experts up at the Capitol is on and is a great Ames League member. And then we also are joined by Eleanor Levin. I hope I pronounced your name right, um, who is with the Iowa City um, new delegation. They got a whole fresh new delegation of uh, legislators coming to the Capitol. Um, it was just elected. And thank you guys for volunteering or not volunteering, spending so much of your time trying to make Iowa better by running for office in this crazy environment <laughs> that we have now. So I just wanted to introduce them and let you know they are also on the call. If I miss somebody, I apologize. Feel free to jump on. I think I caught everybody. But one of the questions I know that came up early on in the chat was um, Representative Height having been one of those individuals who opposed the voucher bill and was on it, uh, uh, chaired education, lost his primary to Helena Hayes, who will be coming in. Um, I think somebody had asked if you knew who might be the new education chair. I think that's what the question was. Uh, no, uh, is the answer. Um, they have not made those decisions yet. Uh, we are hearing some challenging issues. Amy, do you mind if I share my screen one more time? Because oh, I saw that there were a couple of issues of folks asked about, you know, whether or not we'll have folks who are still willing to stand up and say no to vouchers. I will not be sharing these slides uh, beyond uh, this brief presentation, but one of my other jobs at the Iowa State Education Association is being um, our senior government relations professional, which means there's a political component to the work that I do, and I appreciate you're a nonpartisan organization, a bipartisan organization. Believe it or not, so is the Iowa State Education Association. Uh, and we really highlighted that by engaging um, in some work with our GOP allies during the 2022 uh, June primary with our political action committee. Um, and we made a number of recommendations for people who stood with us and other advocates for public education in opposition of vouchers. Unfortunately, um, we had one person uh, remain standing after uh, the governor, quite frankly, engaged heavily in taking out members of her own party because they stood in the way of her voucher proposal. And I just want to let you know the kind of investment we were up against, just so you have um, just a point of reference. 
and I know we're talking to a very politically astute group of folks that you've got on this this call tonight, uh, Teresa and uh, Amy. Um, more than six hundred thousand dollars was spent by pro voucher groups to get rid of the five recommended Republicans uh, that ISCA worked with during this last legislative session. Um, and I will tell you, for the first time, we just saw a recent lobby registration for an in-state advocate for a group called Americans for Prosperity, which is a Koch brother funded organization. They're gonna be working with Sandra Conlin, who many people know up at the state house. She's worked on a whole host of issues and she can be quite persuasive. She's gonna be a formidable opponent. But this will be the first year in the 2023 session where they will have an in-state lobbyist. That's how serious they are about moving with this voucher proposal. We also saw investments from the American, American Federation for Children, uh, which is an organization that was created by the DeVos family. You might remember Betsy DeVos serving as the department or secretary of the Department of Education under Donald Trump. Uh, and then the family leader, which is not surprising, right? They, of course, support uh, parochial uh, education uh, institutions. But to your point about Dustin Height, this was the kind of mailers that were sent out in his district. Um, and he was a very well-respected member of his caucus uh, and by many legislators on all sides of the aisle up at the state house, and someone that we had a very good working relationship with. But these were the links that they went to go to to get rid of him to get him out of the way. I will tell you, Helena Hayes, who has replaced him and will be joining us at the State House in January, um, happens to be one of the founders, I believe, of an organization called the Innocence Project. Uh, and many of you might remember her if you listen to some of our subcommittee discussions on Jake Chapman's bill related to sinister teachers um, and on some of the other materials, in particular, um, speaking up against uh, resources for LGBTQ kids that are in libraries across our state. Um, and so there's been a full court press uh, to turn folks over and to have people who support vouchers um, in the legislature. I will tell you, since that primary, we have gone on to make additional recommendations for Republicans in the House including Representative Gary Moore, who was the uh, most recent appropriations chair in the House Republican Caucus, who refused to let the voucher bill go through his appropriations committee. Um, Mike Sexton is another example. He's a former leader in the House Republican Caucus. Representative Megan Jones, Representative Brian Losey, Representative Brian Best, and Representative Brent Segrist, who to my knowledge was the first House Republican who stood up after his election in 2020 and said, I'm not supporting vouchers. And when we can find someone who is willing to say that out loud, even if it's not popular with Governor Reynolds, it helps us set off a domino effect where other people think it's safe to express their opinions as well. To Margaret's point, we're not hearing overwhelming public support for a voucher proposal. Most people would prefer those resources be utilized to better resource our public school system because people like their public schools. They like their public school teachers, right? And that's where they would they would prefer the resources be spent. And so what we need to do is make sure that we help to educate not only the incoming legislators, but also those existing legislators who, with all due respect, some of them have not been in a school building since they graduated from one. Okay, this is just the reality that we're dealing with. Not everybody is a public education expert. And so that's why we need help making sure that people understand the preferences in supporting our public education system. I will tell you, um, we have heard rumors that Steve Holt, who happened to be the floor manager of House File 802, is interested in being the next chair of education. We've heard that John Wills, uh, who had hoped to floor manage the voucher proposal in the House, is interested. We've also heard that moderate individuals like Chad Ingalls, who's a former president of a school board from Fayette County, is interested in being the chair of education. And I will tell you that I know I, my organization, and I assume Margaret's and some of our other education stakeholder groups are actively having conversations with leadership to try to positively influence those discussions. We're also trying to positively influence the discussions uh, about who might be the chair of the education committee in the Senate. So Senator Kornbach has someone reasonable to work with as the previous chair today, uh, we found out uh, previous chair of education, Amy Sinclair will now be serving as Senate president as Jake Chapman was unsuccessful in his reelection efforts. So we're gonna have, we're gonna have some new folks to work with. I am trying to do my best to look at this as an opportunity to educate and build additional relationships. 
Because if we don't provide a counterpoint to this small but loud hyperpartisan extremist minority, um, then they can run with it, right? But we have to let them know where Iowa's at and what really would be beneficial for Iowa, not some pet project. Thank you, Melissa. That's, you answered a lot of those questions that are in the chat. So if anybody wants to raise their hand and unmute or go ahead and unmute one at a time. I know you guys aren't shy. You've never been shy. <laughs> if you have questions or you don't even know how where to begin, right? <laughs> oh, I can't see who. Just, oh, Linda, go ahead. Yes. Um, this is, I heard both of the speakers at the Iowa Ideas Conference um, put on by the Gazette. And I'm, I'm still not understanding why the governor and legislators feel that private schools are better than public schools. And I don't think that they can answer that question, except that they want a choice. So Is, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, I, I think if you go back to my list of some of the other pieces of divisive legislation we're going to see, some folks won't say it out loud, but it's because they're afraid of their kids being in an environment um, where they're going to be exposed to kids that are different than their child. Um, quite frankly, it, it's kind of like when we got, not to get too weedy, but when we got rid of the voluntary diversity plans mm -hmm. that um, stopped open enrollment a couple of years ago, let's, let's be real clear. Um, and I, I'm already going to be super popular in the next session, so I'm just going to let it go. That was about white flight, folks. That's what that was about. That wasn't written in the bill, but that's exactly what that was about. It was about how we, how, what if parents don't want their kids to be with diverse populations? Now we said it was about socioeconomic standards, but we all know that's not exactly what it was about, right? We are having the same situation happening now on some of these other issues. Um, how many of you, I'm sorry, I can't see everybody's raised hands. How many people heard about a scandal related to litter boxes in classrooms? That was not actually, yeah, there were no litter boxes in classrooms. They're not litter boxes, but it was tied back to conversations about respecting a student's pronouns. Right. And we heard rumors of there are kids who want to be identified as, as cats. I heard even from one of my Republican allies, kids who want to identify as unicorns. Well, guess what? Unicorns have pronouns, too. Right. So that's not even a legitimate argument. But that, that's not what it's about. This is all to try to scapegoat larger issues of, um, I, I think, wanting to shield children from, frankly, the world and the environment that we live in. And here's, here's the real interesting part, folks. Um, we had the trans uh, girl uh, athlete uh, bill last legislative session, uh, which by the way, the actions the state took puts us in direct conflict with federal law, but neither here nor there. Those things don't slow us down at the state legislature. But let's be clear, those issues have been popping up for ages. Do you know who's been dealing with them? School district, teachers, the athletic organization. This is not new. Right, but because somebody wants to take it and distract it with a larger hyperpartisan, which is what we're trying to get out of the education conversation, right? These are the tactics that they're using, I think, to try to gin up support for private schools. And then I think we also, and again, this is my last, and then I'll be quiet. <laughs> my last, do not underestimate someone's higher aspirations who's in a high place of control, okay? She's got a lot of competition across the country and look at some of the competition that might move forward and where did they come from? They are from places that are highlighted in Margaret's example um, where they have expanded to cool choice options. So, um, and all of it is, is also, I think, moving forward on the premise that Iowans don't know what we're already doing, frankly, to subsidize non-public schools and all of the services that we're already providing in partnership to make sure that all kids have access to quality education. You make a very good point. I don't think Iowans do understand how much money is going to private schools. How can we help get that information out? Will you be able to share some of your presentation with the league? Yeah, you bet. We'll send those PowerPoints to Amy and she can distribute them to you so you have access to all of those. And, and our contact information is in both of those too. So if there's something else you heard that's not in there that you want documentation for, just reach out, we'll be happy to send it to you. Thank you so much. 
I greatly yeah, appreciate it. The invite also had links to um, their websites. It has a lot of great information on it too. So I'll make sure I get those out to you as well. Before I go to Senator Kornbach, I wanted to make sure Carolyn Stevenson, did you, you, you had your hand up and then went down. If you, if you want to jump in and ask a question or maybe it already was answered. Um, oh, just agreeing. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Senator Kornbach, you're up. Okay, well, thank you uh, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, I want everybody to know that Margaret and Melissa are just terrific, terrific, terrific resources in the legislature, uh, at least for those people who actually care about facts. Um, they are terrific uh, advocates for public school. More important than that, they're terrific advocates for kids. Uh, and one of the things that frustrates me the most about the legislature in the last couple of years it seems that the folks on the Republican side have just again and again and again tried to drive wedges of, of doubt and, and uh, disrespect between parents and the public schools. Uh, I just wish the uh, adults would quit fighting with each other and join hands and focus on the kids. But um, that's not what we're doing. I just wanted to add a little bit. Uh, uh, Margaret uh, touched on a couple of ways in which school funding is very complicated. It is mu even more complicated than she hinted. Uh, but the key thing, the core thing that we vote on every year is something called a state cost per pupil. All right, that's basically how much school districts are allowed to spend on each kid. This year, it's $7,413, $7,400. Over the last six years, had we simply kept up with inflation, it would be $8,100. So we're more than $700, $742 short of keeping up with inflation. That's about 10%, all right? We're about, we, need to, we would need to increase the state cost per people about 10% just to get uh, even with past year's inflation, not in, kind of including the inflation that's going on right now. For $742, what could you do? You could put a new laptop in the hands of every school kid in Iowa with a couple hundred bucks left over for up-to-date software. Or if you add it up over 20, 25 kids in the classroom, you could cover the, sa the salary of a teacher's aide to, to double the amount of personal attention kids get. Or uh, you could put about $15,000 more into that teacher's salary. And boy, that would, I think, help to deal with this uh, teacher shortage that uh, we're talking about. Talked to a little conference at Iowa State uh, a week or so of, uh, on that very subject. They're very concerned. Um, so if you add up the, um, the shortfall uh, to uh, K-12 education funding over the last six years, Add it up, convert it to current dollars, it adds up to a billion dollars, billion with a B. Now, where could we get a billion dollars? Where could we have gotten a billion dollars to make up that shortfall? Well, the governor is very proud about boasting about our $1,900,000,000 of surplus. She's been piling up a big surplus instead uh, by shortchanging our kids' future. By the way, we're also a half a billion dollars short of inflation for higher ed. So um, these are facts that that you know I've shared with as many people as possible. Uh, you need to promulgate those uh, on out uh, to everybody you know of. And uh, let's see if we can't get a better uh, allowable growth is what I call it or supplemental state aid number uh, this year. Thank you, Senator, and thanks for everything you do up at the Capitol. Jane, you have a question. Oh, we're, I think you're on mute. You're still on mute. To speak. There you go. Okay. Um. Uh-oh, you went back on mute. <laughs> Sorry. Um, my question is, do private school students have to take those national assessment of educational progress? Uh, 
No, they're only mandated of, of public schools. Um, I think that private schools um, can volunteer to take them. If I remember correctly, I'd have to look into it, but they're not required. Yes, okay. I believe they can. And I think there are some other assessments that just from an accreditation perspective that they can also opt into and participate in as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great, thanks, Jane. Um, Renee, you're up. So could you repeat those numbers that you said, how much um, this year we were spending per pupil versus what we should be spending? I just think my numbers just got, I don't know if I wrote them down wrong or what, but I, I didn't understand where it was, we're 700 some dollars short every year for what we should be spending versus what we are spending. Um, I've cranked the numbers. I'm a retired economics professor, so you know, <laughs> I've, I've done this a few times over my career. Um, the shortfall, uh, the comparison was figuring everything exactly the same between the two, between the, the reality and the alternative. Uh, if we had simply kept up with inflation, uh, it would be $8,155 per pupil. What we're actually doing is 714, uh, seven, uh, sorry, $7,413. So the difference is 70, $742 per pupil. Uh, by the way, that's for ordinary pupils. If you want to talk about the kids who are on uh, special ed, the way we do special ed with the state cost per pupil, it's a multiple, it's an additional weighting, all right, for the kids with the severest. Uh, special ed needs, the shortfall relative to inflation this year alone, $2,775 per each of those high need kids. Wow. The That's overall sad. shortfall is a billion $49 million. That's cumulatively over six years, uh, half of that, literally half of that from the current fiscal year. But, you know, I mean, so now that we've lost a lot of people that really were for public education and for teachers, and we couldn't get the funding through before, how are we going to get the funding increased now? We're going to continue to make our case that we have to make these investments to meet our students where we're at. And I would also encourage folks we have dozens and dozens of new legislators joining us in the state house in January, and that's on both sides of the aisle. Folks who um, I'm very excited uh, to work with, not only folks who have identified themselves as being strong supporters of public schools, but some who have some innovative ideas, I think, to help us address some of the issues that perhaps have um, not lended themselves to the flexibility and innovative nature uh, of, of our students these days. So I think I think we're also going to have um, some additional support as we continue to see struggles in our rural school communities. As consolidation continues to knock down the doors of some of these communities where they have lost local businesses and they're watching their 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 communities and their towns frankly dry up. What is holding those communities together is their school districts and they need to have adequate resources. So we don't have kids on buses for two hours each direction, right? And so we don't have literally schools or rather towns just ceasing to exist in the state of Iowa. That's, you know, I'm glad you mentioned that, Melissa, because the, the rural school group is um, has a strong statement in their legislative platform this year opposed to expansion of private school support. And they're concerned about our teacher shortage because they don't pay as much. It's an economy of scale issue. And the private schools, frankly, don't pay as much as our urban districts, but they sure pay more than the rural ones. So if they have to get a good science teacher, they're gonna have to recruit from a place that is already struggling to attract and retain great teachers. And, and those rural schools are, um, they're gonna face issues of not being able to survive both because of budget and because of accreditation. Uh, they won't be able to meet the requirements. So you're feeling pretty hopeful. You know, I, I am hopeful. And, and, and like Melissa said, it's a clean slate, all these brand new people. I think it's like the first day of school and you have this whole mm -hmm. classroom of third graders that are ready to learn and they need help from everybody around them. And they're going to hear from constituents and they're going to hear from us. And, um, and I think the public had a lot of conversation about support of our public schools in this last election. 
So it's going to be a theme that is recurring that um, I hope they understand and weigh in and, and support. And the folks I deal with right now, we're trying to get them to find those people in their communities. I call it the people who could care, you know, the, the business leaders who need to have a quality workforce and a great school so they can attract somebody to work in their, in their business. Um, even the, the County Farm Bureau president who wants to make sure that there are science teachers in their community. Um, there, there are partners uh, across the entire spectrum of Iowans that care about this, that, that we need to get to help us. I, I really think that point that you made about Iowans not knowing how much is available for private schools, how do we get that information out? Because that is really, really big. And I have no idea how you're going to do that without money to put it in all the papers, you know, there should be like full page ads showing how much, because I don't think most people are aware of that. And that's why they're pushing all of this stuff. And it's a lie. If that's all available, it's amazing to me. I, I didn't realize that. Well, I'll tell you what, Thank both you. Margaret and I did a lot of work this last legislative session, first and foremost, educating legislators who'd actually voted on some of these legislation, these legislative pieces, who didn't realize how much that they had approved to already support non-public schools. Um, but yeah, we will definitely work on making sure that that information um, is, is updated and is available as quickly as we possibly can. Thank you guys. And um, believe it or not, we're already getting close to the 8.30 cutoff. So I'm gonna have Carol be our last um, question. Go ahead, Carol. Thank you. And I probably this is more of a comment than a question, but Melissa alluded to this earlier. I, I think this year is going to be an even bigger challenge with the vouchers because they are going to try to bribe every legislator who is really against vouchers by putting combining and locking together all these things that they know the rural legislators really want. And so it's it's really going to be a balancing act of are 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 those legislators willing to go home and say, yeah, I had to vote against 5% SSA because vouchers are going to do more harm. So it, it, it and it's going to take all of us communicating with our legislators to educate them and keep them on the right track. I'm so glad you said that, Carol, because I think of your group in particular as being the guardians of good democratic process. And when we put all of these different policies into one great big omnibus bill, it's hard to have a conversation about the intricacies of each policy. And if you all just show up and say, stop doing that. Let's have a good discussion about each policy on its own merits and, and not put us in that predicament of having to um, uh, vote one way because there are other things in there that are important. And it, that's, you know, the democratic process really is about let's talk about these policies and decide if it's good for Iowans or not. That's a, such a great way to end this. Guardians of good democratic process. <laughs> thank you, Margaret. Um, thank you. I, I just want to thank Margaret and Melissa again for spending an hour and a half of their evening with us on this issue. Um, I know we will be in um, touch with you on how we can help. We do have some good letter to the editor writers. Um, great way to get um, information out to the public, as you all know. Um, so we may be calling on some of you that have been on this call to help out um, in those ways too, because we, um, I think it's clear the public doesn't really know what the bill does um, and, and how much we're investing in our schools already. So thank you again. I will make a note that I will get the PowerPoints from Melissa and Margaret and get that out to you along with the link to this video. Um, I know that there were a number of people that signed up just because they wanted to have access to the video but couldn't make it tonight. So um, this information will go out to um, the more than 100 people that signed up for this um, as well. So again, I thank you. Therese, do you have any final words for us? 
Uh, again, I just want to thank these wonderful experts on education, Margaret and Melissa, for joining us tonight. And also, Amy, thank you for also uh, setting all this up for us. And now we know what's ahead of us and what we're going to need to do to advocate and talk to our legislators when we visit the Capitol, uh, email, phone, when they come to our communities for uh, sessions that we advocate for education because it is, for me, it's one of the, one, one of the most important things that, 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 that's, that's before us. So thanks again, everybody. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.